we have these crossroads. And you know, either way you choose, your life is going to be different. The universe doesn't exist, but God thinks it does. We have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Stupidity has a definite evolutionary function. I am all for abolishing stupidity, but before it goes, we should pay tribute to it. Hello and welcome to the Nonsense Bazaar. We're your hosts, I'm Sequoia Kennedy. And I'm Sequoia Kennedy. You son of a bitch. And I'm Willow Truman. Yeah, that's right. And this is the Nonsense Bazaar. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> 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 well, maybe it's kind of funny because this, this is a pop culture episode that I wrote. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's happened before. Yeah, that's true. This isn't usually the type of thing that you make an episode about. Always got to keep guessing. And I don't know anything about it. Yeah, well... Today we're talking about a band, but not just a band. One of the, the strangest, funniest, and one of the most fucking genuinely kick-ass bands of all time, which I just found out about like a month ago, and it's just my favorite damn thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like the best rabbit hole I've ever ever fallen down. The KLF, also known as the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo, also known as the Jams, also briefly known as the Time Lords. Any other... They were also known as the fuckers who fired a clip of blanks out of a machine gun into the crowd when they won the Brit Awards, um, then dropped a dead sheep at the after party (sighs) and fucked off only to resurface uh, with a 45 minute film that they toured of them in a house in remote Scotland, systematically lighting their last one million pounds on fire. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. At the time, they were the biggest selling singles band in the world. You might love it. I love it. Most people thought they were fucking douchebags. <laughs> did not get it at the uh, point. You know. There was nothing to get is the thing they didn't get. But that's not even the reason why I wanted to, to do this episode. So the name KLF stands for ostensibly Copyright Liberation Front sometimes. But as I said, they were slash are also known as the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. I like that. And it's in this name that we get to the true weirdness of just what the KLF was about. Or rather, what weird currents they found themselves enveloped in. So, do do you know about the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo? I mean, now I do. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, now you do. (laughs) But the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo is a reference to a concept in the book The Illuminatus Trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson and Bob Shea. Wilson shows up in our opening music. He's the guy who says, the universe doesn't exist, but God thinks it does. And uh, stupidity has a definite evolutionary function. I fucking love Robert Anton Wilson. Yep. Like, of all the counterculture fucking writer guys' heads or whatever. He's just impossible not to love. Yeah. I mean, although some people don't. Some people don't. He said said some dated things, you know, but he said some really cool things. But, like, of all the thought leaders, (laughs) to use a stupid shit-ass term, of that, like, period of the counterculture, Bob's mine. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He's the one I, I vibe with the most. And Illuminatus was a seminal work in the tradition of Discordianism, a half-fake, half-real, depending on which direction you look at it, religion that worships Eris, the Greek goddess of chaos. And although Robert Anton Wilson wasn't one of the founders of it, he was a central figure in the joke that went too far slash CIA psyop slash joke that didn't go far enough slash non-CIA psyop slash religious sacrament slash joke that went and indeed continues to go as far as it needs to. (laughs) I'm speaking, of course, about Operation Mindfuck. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, which we will get into once we get into the meat of bullshit. Like, Discordianism is a fucking thing, you know? It's one of my favorite things. It's one of my favorite things as well. Uh, And the story of KLF is an examination of what being lost in the extraordinarily powerful current of discordian chaos magic looks like a web of synchronicities absurdities infuriating and insufferable antics and the the disregard for the comfort of your fellow man in service of the bit which look i love this shit no i do too i do and i've surfed that wave of absurdity before it's great I enjoy things that make me uncomfortable and yeah. in fact i seek out those experiences like uh, yeah now, but the, okay, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, like there's some weird shit about discordianism for sure. And, you know, just like just like our episode on uh, 
Michael Aquino's mind war didn't make us any friends in the conspiracy world. And I'm sure it didn't. It definitely didn't. And by the way, we're not done with his ass yet. Like, like I said in that episode, you know, perhaps I read more. It's funny how people are like complex three dimensional characters and shit with like good and bad and like gray all mixed up in a way that isn't easily reducible to a fucking hot take. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Almost like the golden apple in the Pentagon. Almost is. Almost. Chaos and order. Forever at war with one another. Indeed. But yeah, Discordianism has also become like a big old bugaboo in conspiracy lore. Because I only recently became aware of that. Really? Yeah. I mean, but of course, though. <laughs> but of course. But of course, like the Operation Mindfuck and everything we're going to talk about in a very short bit. I mean, they, it's where the conspiracy theory comes from. Mm-hmm. I did know about the Operation capital Mindfuck. C, capital T conspiracy theory. This is it's, it's Operation Mindfuck. We'll, we'll get into Yeah, that. it's not something that I find like in the conspiracy world that you should be f- afraid of. I mean, maybe. We'll get into that. There's there's some interesting shit. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, d- Discordianism does have like really close proximity to uh, the JFK assassination. And also, the fucking I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even shitting you. Yep. Like, that whole, that entire story is for another day, sort of. Oh, yeah. So, like, I, I'd never heard of these guys. Because they deleted their entire catalog in 1992, and you just couldn't listen to it. Interesting. Well, like, you could. Like, it was on YouTube, but it wasn't on any streaming services, and you couldn't, like, buy it legally, Mm -hmm. I guess. That was part of their whole, like, big fuck-off stunt, was they just deleted their entire catalog while they were the biggest, best-selling singles band in the world. I love that. It's fucking insane. It's just truly insane. I mean, they were the biggest selling singles band in the world. They They were pioneers in fucking... Uh, sampling and like trance and house and all this shit, like r- an actual extremely influential band that were accused of just being genius marketers and doing publicity stunts and shit. But, well, yeah. Yeah. So, so someone in, the, in our Discord uh, was talking about another band, a story we should look into, and said, oh, they were kind of like next to that whole KLF thing. And I was like, I have no idea what that is. Let me look it up. And I was like, oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever read in my life. And that was like a month or so ago. Yeah. So there's this book by John Higgs called The KLF, Chaos, Magic, and the Band Who Burned a Million Pounds. And on its own, this book is so fucking good. Like it is, it is even in itself a synchronicity engine, just like the existence of the band. The KLF is a synchronicity engine, just like Discordianism is a synchronicity Mm -hmm. engine. Like weird shit might happen if you read this book. It's, it gets strange. I highly recommend it, and that's sort of the what I want to do this episode on is that kind of weirdness to, that that reaches you know, out and grabs you. Yeah, the weirdness that reaches out and grabs you. The the synchronicities and the what the fuck. Like I don't, I didn't really want to tell like a story of how a band did good. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> gives a shit, right? Like, no, how a band did good, then burned a million pounds, then fucked off how, at the height of their career. How a band did crazy and built a myth. Yeah, it's fucking sick. Love it. For now. We're going to pull a tarot card, then we're going to talk about the KLF, also known as the Justified Ancients of Moomoo, furthermore known as the Jams, a story best summed up in the words of comedian Doug Stanhope. It's only funny if you do it. Hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's funny. The Hierophant. Excellent. That's fucking great. This is very much a card of established religion, which is just hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stability. Myth. Tradition. That's fucking so funny. <laughs> one of the funniest, like, on-point cards it could have been. Wow. Yeah. Good job. I, I was almost, like, afraid I'd get, like, the magician and it would just be, like, too on-point to be comfortable with. Mm-hmm. That's just enough on-point while also being fucking hilarious. Oh, yes. Which is kind of the Discordian thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that he's here to sit with us for this episode. Yes. We'll talk about him at the end. At the end.
Wow. I say this with the utmost respect. It reminds me of the music that my gym teacher made us run around to in middle school. Yeah. But like on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That jock. Also, that's that's the that one is my of of the three like of the stadium house singles that they did. That's my least favorite one. It's so silly. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're gonna get sillier. We're oh. gonna get so much fucking. Okay. Silly. You have no idea. Okay, I'm with it. I always forget that you haven't been like over my shoulder watching me research and write. No, I don't know I'm, any of this. This is okay. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, you don't. I forget that. <laughs> I forget that sometimes. I did this with fucking show cause R too. Like you don't even know. Never forget that I don't know anything. Right. You said it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's right. You don't know shit. You probably haven't even heard a lot of this stuff. <laughs> Fuck yeah. All right. Let's go. All right. The KLF is slash was. The product of two men, Bill Drummond and Jimmy Cotty. And as every other person who has told this story has done, basically, we're going to be focusing more on Bill Drummond. Why? Because Jimmy Cotty was the brains behind the music of the KLF, which is super important. Like I said, they pioneered sampling in music, as well as like ambient house and like down tempo shit. They were legitimately ahead of their time in a lot of ways musically. And that was a lot of Jimmy Cotty's doing. But getting into the nitty gritty of that is like the job of like a music podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Drummond was not the musical architect of the KLF. He was the maniac agent of chaos. The truly insane, unassuming looking person. That was just, I'd call him a wizard, That, but that sort of implies intentionality. Which a lot of people think perhaps he had, I don't know. Chaos architect. He was a chaos sorcerer. Oh, you know? wonderful. Uh, this, this man is insane. And I feel as though I understand him. Mm-hmm. And like, okay. In 1978, Drummond was like, was playing with a band called Big in Japan. And he wanted to start a record label, but he wanted it to be a label that only released singles. Cool. Seven inch singles. Bill Drummond fucking loved seven inch singles. They were perfect. Like the, the perfect pop song existed outside of context. You know, it's just three and a half minutes of like harmony that any asshole could get down with. All right. That is, I like an album, you know? Yeah, but, I, but it, it's true that a lot of pop albums, there's usually really only two or three good ones on there, and the rest are kind of filler, fluff. Yeah, they would actually take that idea and take it to an extreme level. Mm-hmm. Releasing their Stadium House trilogy as, like, the first three tracks of an album, and then the rest of it is just, like, down-tempo, extremely pretty shit and experimental shit. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Drummond also had a love of the idea of things. Like, he, he wanted to sign his friend Julian Cope's band, The Teardrop Explodes, based solely on the name, The Teardrop Explodes. And despite the fact that the band had no recordings, had played no shows, and didn't know how to play their instruments. They had a sick name. Drummond could just see the vibe of it. Right? <laughs> Build something off of that. And they did, until that band like collapsed into drugs and stuff, but... Yeah. As it goes. Yeah, so it goes. At the time, they still didn't know how to play their instruments. So instead, Drummond signed another band, Echo and the Bunnymen. Yes. Yeah. And like, this is, Echo and the Bunnymen is one of the bands that broke open my own doors to a wider world of music than just like the standard rock and roll jam band music for musicians worldview. Oh, they're so good. Oh, yeah, dude. Echo and the Bunnymen was one of the first bands that made me go, yo, there's a whole world out there. Mm-hmm. Even though they're... British, and that's hard. That's just next door. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but Echo and the Bunnymen has a hell of a name, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One of those names with, like, mythology behind it. It's sick. It's like, you just know there's something there. It's eerie. Yeah. The reality of it was that Echo and the Bunnymen was just a name suggested by one of their friends. But the band claimed that the, you know, for journalists or whatever, to get a better story, that Echo was their drum machine... And that they were the bunny men in a similar way that, like, Playboy models were bunny girls. <laughs> Bill Drummond thought that was a bullshit story. He didn't like that. He had his own personal meaning for the name, and he far preferred his version. It was triggered by the sleeve of their first single, Pictures on My Wall, which had this, like, scratched silhouette drawing of a strange, eerie beast. <clears throat> yeah. The two shapes emerging from the top of its head would perhaps normally be interpreted as, as horns. But in the context of Echo and the Bunnymen, could be considered to maybe be rabbit ears. Right. Right. But it was a sinister and powerful rabbit. 
beastly rat. Yeah. And Drummond intuitively knew that this creature, whatever it was... Alpha Bugs Bunny. ...was Echo. Yes. Yes. The bunny men, therefore, were Echo's followers. And so Drummond was, like, going to the library in the... He's going to the central library in the center of Liverpool and, like, searching through the, all the tomes in the religion, myth, and folklore sections... As he wrote in 1998, I was on the hunt for real or even imagined information on who this weird Echo character was. He was trying to find folkloric correspondences to this idea of- I love it. Yeah. He created in his own mind a synthesis of all these different stories from native people from the far north, from Siberia, North Canada, Scandinavia, about a trickster spirit mm -hmm. who takes the form of a rabbit. Well, what do you know? <laughs> what, what do you know? Isn't that uh, something? Yep. Yeah. Drummond began merging these separate tales in his head because he was finding like actual folkloric stories from these northern countries about a trickster spirit that sometimes takes the form of a rabbit. And Bill Drummond merged these tales in his head, creating a clearer image of this elemental spirit from the dark winter. When the band gave their story to journalists uh, about the drum, the drum machine and the bunny men, like the bunny girls and shit. This is what uh, Drummond said. Willow, if you if you please. I had to stop myself from butting in and saying, no, no, you've got it wrong. It's nothing to do with bunny girls. Bunny men are the scattered tribes that populate the northern rim of the world and are followers of a mythical being, divine spirit, a prime mover who takes the earthly form of a rabbit. <laughs> but I didn't. Mm. He didn't put in. No, no, no. You can't. You would just be crazy. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to keep stuff to yourself for a little bit. Well, then he was also the type of fellow who, uh, he planned an Echo and the Bunnymen tour along ley lines. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is beautiful. <laughs> Which notably didn't intersect with anywhere that would be good for a band to play for any reason. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They did it. They, Echo and the Bunnymen were good sports about it. It was a shit tour, but. You know, was it their first tour ever? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. And what's funny is that, like, across across the pond, oh, uh, some years prior, America, another feller had become fascinated with the concept of a trickster spirit who took the form of a rabbit. I was, oh? That was Robert Anton Wilson. Oh. Le legitimately. In uh, Cosmic Trigger, he writes about how he, uh, he started, he, I forget what the visual, wait, for some reason, he, he started getting obsessed with the puka, the Irish... Oh my gosh, I went through that phase too. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, there was, it was a whole thing. Like he was, the same thing was happening to Robert Anton Wilson as was happening to Bill Drummond with like this emergent rabbit trickster spirit. Remember our bonus episode on the Easter Bunny? Well, yeah. How everybody kept seeing these humanoid rabbits everywhere? Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, well, we'll get to it. Wilson, like he uh, had seen, like, he, he got especially freaked out when he uh, was watching the Jimmy Stewart flick Harvey. Yes. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. Dude, it was my mom's, like, favorite fucking movie of all time. Your it's mom has movie. such good taste. Yeah, dude. It's amazing. But in there, like, a Mr. Wilson is, like, addressed by name in, like, a way that was very synchronistic with the Puka and the Robert Anton. Mm-hmm. And, and it freaked him the fuck out. Felt freaked personal. him the fuck out. He loved it. Yeah. He has my best reactions to, like, that type of shit. Like yeah, he was freaked the fuck out, yeah, little, but he loved it. Yes. <laughs> a little bit, ooh, that's freaky, but yeah. cool. Yeah. And it's just so strange. Like, I've seen Harvey so many times because it's my mom's favorite movie. And it's about a six foot tall fucking invisible white rabbit with a puka named Harvey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what is a puka for our listeners that don't know? It's a, it's an Irish, like, I don't know if it's one of the fae, but it's like a, it's a spirit. Mm -hmm. It shapeshifts. Yeah, it's a shapeshifter. I think it has other forms besides the rabbit, but that's like a common. Yeah, horse. Yeah, the horse. Yeah. But Robert Anton Wilson's was the rabbit. Version. Mm -hmm. And like, look, I don't know. If you guys have been with us long enough, you know that the emergent symbol in the nonsense bizarre lore for our own arch nemesis, trickster spirit, whatever the fuck it is, uh, that will never, ever leave us alone. The fucking St. Germain. I love him, though. I do, I do now too. <laughs> Chief object of worship of the I am religious movement. Uh, we started associating St. Germain with Bugs Bunny a long time ago. Yeah, we did. That has just been the thing. Oh, and then we found some odd synchronicities around that. Oh yeah, the lots, 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 lots. And that was just because of a, a joke with one of our friends about Bugs Bunny being a god of chaos. Mm-hmm. 
So just hold all that in your head. Yes. Even our own weird rabbit synchronicities. Uh, just, just try to hold all that. I know it's I know it's a lot. So Discordianism was founded in 1957 in a bowling alley by Carrie Thornley and Greg Hill after a discussion about order and chaos. Thornley had written some poems about order arising out of chaos, and Greg Hill argued that chaos is the actual underpinning of all reality, that the concept of order itself is an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> Don't chuckle like that. <laughs> From this discussion, the two founded Discordianism, a willfully contradictory and paradoxical religion that is a satire with a hint of reality or reality with a hint of satire, depending on how you look at it. Yin yang. Yeah. If you, whatever side you look at, it will be the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It revolves around Eris, the Greek goddess of chaos, and includes things such as the law of fives, that everything happens in five. And the 23 enigma into its mythos that t the number 23 just shows up all the fucking time. It sure does. I just remembered it did fucking today too. There was a post on like r slash psychic about like some TikTok psychic psychic saying September 23rd would be the fucking end of days or some bullshit. If I recorded every single time 23 came up, I would drive myself insane. Yeah. Now, is that because it shows up a lot or because you know about- Because I'm primed to look for it. Right. Magic. <laughs> but I, it actually did show up like a bunch today. I just now remembered that. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. So two plus three equals five. That is also true. Yeah. I don't think they came from the same place. That's just another attribute yeah, you of know. the law of fives. It's the law of fives in action, you know. Thornley's friendship with Robert Anton Wilson would lead to the Illuminatus trilogy, from which came the justified agents of Mumu, and would lead to Operation Mindfuck, Man, aren't all good things born in a, bo a bowling alley? Yes. Now, it's rather personally disturbing that we have to take that detour right after the rabbit stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The mindfuck detour? Yeah, so, yeah. Well, we're not quite there yet, but just the detour back to the founding of Discordianism. Okay. From which this all flowers. And I know this might be confusing, but I promise it'll make sense in a second. Carrie Thornley, one of the founders of Discordianism, which led to Robert Anton Wilson's rabbit synchronicities, and then led to... In a fucked up way, Bill Drummond's rabbit trickster spirit synchronicities and how our rabbit trickster spirit is Saint Germain. And we had no idea about any of this. Carrie Thornley was a graduate, and I use the term loosely, of a thing called the Freedom School, founded by one Robert Lefebvre, who is a bigwig within the I am. Okay. I think Saint Germain's a fucking rabbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's odd to me. I don't know. It's one of the forms that he takes. It's just, it's odd. It's just fucking curious is all I'm, is all I'm saying. Mm. Anyway, Discordianism also weaves through shit like the JFK assassination, too. You know. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll get to that. We're getting to that right now. Okay, we're there. Yeah. The connection between Discordianism and the JFK assassination largely revolves around, again, Carrie Thornley. Thornley served in the U.S. Marine Corps with Lee Harvey Oswald, the man accused of assassinating President John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. Thornley had thought Oswald to be a weird guy, and he wrote a novel about Oswald before Oswald shot the president. Do you think that through the, I don't know, the cosmic ether, somehow he felt that somebody had written a fucking book about him? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Thornley was subsequently called to testify before the Warren Commission, which is the, the body responsible for investigating the JFK assassination. He confirmed that he knew Oswald, but had no additional information to contribute to the conspiracy theories that were proliferating at the time. Now, Jim Garrison, subject of fucking Oliver Stone's movie JFK, the district attorney of New Orleans, he later accused Thornley of being part of a CIA conspiracy to assassinate the president. <laughs> yeah, though the allegations were never substantiated. Very curiously, Thornley was living in New Orleans at the time, and the first edition of the Principia Discordia the foundational text of Discordianism was printed on the, the same Xerox machine that uh, Jim Garrison used in his office. It was printed on Jim Gar Garrison's fucking Xerox machine. Mm -hmm. Discordianism is just around the JFK assassination. Right. It's super weird. Even Thornley thought this was super fucking weird, and he would eventually lose his fucking mind. I was actually just going to ask, like, did he start to blame himself? Did he start to think, like, perhaps I did? That's, that's the Operation Mindfuck stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as we already concluded in our episode on the Nine, St. Germain did JFK. <laughs> and RFK. And RFK Jr. Uh, however it happened. So make of that what you will. So to explain how Bill Drummond decided that, in general, 
impossible things are actually very possible, we have to take another detour and talk about fucking Carl Jung because we legitimately have to. You know? Yep. Think about him every day. Yeah. More people do than you'd suspect. Yes. He's hot right now. He been hot. Yeah, that's true. Well, Carl Jung was known for describing synchronicities, and one dream of his in particular set him on the, the path of studying synchronicities. And this dream was also directly responsible for the manifestation of the KLF into existence, Carl Jung's dream, by way of introducing Bill Drummond, who would go on to see visions of rabbit trickster gods, to the work of Robert Anton Wilson, who was already seeing visions of rabbit trickster gods. Actually, ac- actually though. See, what was the dream, though? Young had a dream about walking through Liverpool, which he had never visited. Willow, would you like to read Carl Young's dream? In a dark, sooty city, it was night and winter and dark and raining. I was in Liverpool with a number of Swiss, say half a dozen. I walked through the dark streets. It reminded me of Basel, where the market is down below and you go up through the alley of the dead, which leads to a plateau above to the Petersplatz and the Peterskirch. When we reached the plateau, we found a broad square, dimly illuminated by streetlights, into which many streets converged. The various quarters of the city were arranged radially around the square. In the center was a round pool, and in the middle of it, a small island. While everything around was obscured by rain, fog, smoke, and dimly lit darkness, the little island blazed with sunlight. On it stood a single tree, a magnolia, in a sea of reddish blossoms. It was as though the tree stood in the sunlight and was, at the same time, the source of light. My companions commented on the abominable weather, and obviously did not see the tree. They spoke of another Swiss who was living in Liverpool and and expressed surprise that he should have settled here. I was carried away by the beauty of the tree in the sunlit island, and thought, I know very well why he settled here. Then I awoke. Yeah, it's just some Carl Jung ass shit. Of the dream, Jung said why it meant so much to him. He said, uh, everything was extremely unpleasant, black and opaque, just as I felt then, he wrote. But I had a vision of unearthly beauty, and that was why I was able to live it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A man named Peter O'Halligan also had a dream of a font of life springing up in this exact spot, a spot which he believed to be a corner of the warehouse district in Liverpool. Where a few years after Young uh, wrote about that dream, the Beatles would get their start, where Bill Drummond would play with Big in Japan, and where the day after having his own dream of this magical warehouse district, Peter O'Halligan would see that one of the buildings was available to lease. So he did. Then he would read about Young's dream and commission a bust of Carl Young to be placed outside yeah. of O'Halligan's pub. And nice. prior, yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. Prior to managing Echo and the Bunny Men and all that, Bill Drummond was a, a stage designer. Um, in Liverpool, and he frequented O'Halligan's. One day, O'Halligan told Drummond that he was starting a thing that he called the Liverpool School of Language, Music, Dream, and Pun. Okay. <laughs> yep. He also told Drummond about Young's dream, and uh, Drummond said, I didn't really understand what O'Halligan was on about, but it resonated, and I remembered it almost word for word. Also, he didn't look like a hippie, so he was okay with my prejudices at the time. <laughs> <laughs> So they were at the Liverpool School of Language, Music, Dream, and Pun. They were planning on staging plays. And somehow O'Halligan, uh, like, m- knew, like, or the playwright Ken Campbell and shit and, like, had these connections to this. And the reason he wanted to stage plays was, naturally enough, another of O'Halligan's dreams. In this dream, he had a, there was a building with a raging fire upstairs and a play being performed in a theater in the basement. And there had been a copy of a Playboy magazine on the seat in the theater. <laughs> this didn't immediately make a great deal of sense, but in the world of the dream, it was in some way significant. Mm-hmm. Well, the letters letters to the editor's section of Playboy happened to be the staging ground of Operation Mindfuck. Robert Anton Wilson, as a Discordian convert, and Bob Shea were editors at Playboy, and they cooked up a fake conspiracy theory that they had the brilliant idea to have play out in the letters to the editor section of Playboy magazine. You may have heard of it. One of the letters read, Willow, would you please? I recently heard an old man of right-wing views, a friend of my grandparents, assert that the current wave of assassinations in America is the work of a secret society called the Illuminati. He said that the Illuminati have existed throughout history. They own the international banking cartels, have all been 32-degree masons, and were known to Ian Fleming, who portrayed them as Spectre in his James Bond books for which the Illuminati did away with Mr. Fleming. It was then followed by, like, a reply. 
detailing the history of the 11th century Islamic Hashashin and pointing out that Ian Fleming died of natural causes. But yeah, Robert Anton Wilson and Bob Shea basically invented the Illuminati as we know them today mm -hmm. in the letters to the editor section of Playboy. This was Operation Mindfuck. And it was this, mm, well, an odd thing happened after they were doing their old prank em up. Letters which weren't, weren't written by Wilson or Shea started coming in paranoid about this Illuminati conspiracy theory. While many could be attributed to their, you know, the small group of Discordians just fucking with their buddies, a lot of others appeared to be from complete strangers. Or were they? A problem with Operation Mindfuck was that you couldn't fucking trust anybody. You couldn't trust your friends to be honest about their activities. They weren't pranking you because you were pranking them. <laughs> <laughs> but there appeared to be many conspiratorial letters arriving from people they didn't know. The... The principles printed in the Principia Discordia, which had been printed on Jim Garrison's Xerox machine and written by Terry Thornley, were starting to spread, and they were spreading to people who liked to write letters to Playboy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the, what we call conspiracy theory now was starting to emerge like a like a baby <laughs> just a few years after, um, you know, in the wake of JFK. Yeah. JFK assassination would burst the modern conspiracy theory. The um, engine has warmed up. Yeah. It's revving. Yeah. And like, for the first time, people were openly accusing, you know, the US government of being involved in Kennedy's death, in the death of a president, that there were shadowy hands at work within the government that killed the fucking president, perhaps, or maybe it was weird, or who the fuck knows. The JFK assassination was this like fucking gravity well of uh, synchronicity and weirdness and insanity and like a real crack in reality, it feels like. Um, or maybe that's just part of the plot, which is the whole problem. Mm -hmm. To Robert Anton Wilson and Bob Shea, as they you know read through all the different conspiracy theories, the different accusations, it to them it looked like everyone killed Kennedy. You know, there was the CIA, the mafia, Castro, <laughs> anti-Castro forces. The thing is, pick a villain, any villain. A lot of people wanted that dude dead, like a lot. Yeah, so, it, so they started joking to each other, Wilson and Shea, about like, you know, what if every conspiracy theory was true? <laughs> from, from this came the idea for a novel or trilogy of novels, which the two wrote together between 1969 and 1971. This was Illuminatus, with an exclamation point, yep. trilogy, yep, which they dedicated to Greg Hill and Carrie Thornley. Now, this is uh, the Operation Mindfuck Illuminati thing. That is what would drive Carrie Thornley insane. Because he started to have all these seemingly, he's got dragged to the Warren Committee, you know, all this Did shit. Did I cause the assassination? Yeah. And are there the Illuminati? There was a lot of weird shit. Like, people were following him and stuff. Oh, I'm um, sure they were. Yeah, a lot of weird shit. And he was potentially latent schizophrenic, and he fucking lost it. He's not the only pro Discordian to fucking lose the goddamn mind, I'm sure. But the connection to Bill Drummond and O'Halligan's dream doesn't actually have anything to do with Operation Mindfuck in the Playboy magazine as such. Mm hmm That's, it's not like they opened Playboy and saw this and got inspired. Right. No. The playwright Ken Campbell, who had been drafted into O'Halligan's Jungian Funhouse Theater, was in a bookstore just looking for sci-fi books to adopt, and he just saw Illuminatus. He was like, that's stupid. And he adopted it into a cycle of five plays, which ran for eight and a half hours. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. The production of that thing is in and of itself fucking insane. Robert Anton Wilson even performed in it. They, they ate acid before the show and turned into complete chaos. It's as perfect as an adaptation as possible. Bill Drummond fucking designed the stage for it. And so that meant he had to read the damn thing. And that's how it happened. The plot, such as it is, um, I was also actually named, I was in a band named after something in Illuminatus. It wasn't even my choice. We were called American Rags, which they refer, refer to the American flag as an Illuminatus. Ah. Yeah. And uh, it's my buddy Tim that came up with it. And he's a finer soldier in Eris's army than you could ever ask for without ever meaning to be. Yeah. God bless. Yep. So the extraordinarily complicated and stupid plot of the book boils down to a struggle between order and chaos. It features an organization of enlightened beings called the Illuminati who rule the world. Uh, and they're trying to immanentize the eschaton explicitly. Yeah. That phrase is like on every other fucking page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in reality, the Illuminati was a real organization. It had been founded in Bavaria in 1776. And it was kind of like, 
a more enlightenment ass fucking Freemason. Yeah. Or yeah, essentially. But Shay and Wilson fucking claimed that the organization had in, existed in secrecy ever since, and indeed for centuries beforehand, although most historians insist it only lasted about 10 years. So in Illuminatus, the Illuminati are opposed only by small groups of discordians who have to, have to prevent the Illuminati from bringing about, from imminentizing the eschaton. <laughs> in true discordian sense, they go by many names, such as the ELF, the Arisian Liberation Front, the LDD, the League of Dynamic Discord, also known as the Little Deluded Dopes, and the Justified Ancients of Mumu, otherwise known as the Jams. The Jams had helped organize the assassination of JFK. They were at least as old as the Illuminati and represent the primeval power of chaos. They had once been part of the Illuminati, but they had rebelled in a similar way uh, to fucking Satan rebelling against heaven, and they had either left or been kicked out. Lucifer? Um, yeah. In a similar way to Lucifer. Yes. Yes. The Jams set up a little independent record label to make some decent music while mainstream music was controlled by the Illuminati. And we're still uh, talking about the book. Yes. Just to be clear for our right. listeners. Yes. Yes. Well, so the, you know, because the mainstream music industry was controlled by the Illuminati, that's how they were able to incorporate, they, that's how they got uh, the band MC5 to incorporate the uh, slogan, kick out the jams, motherfuckers, to um, commemorate the glorious occasion of the Illuminati kicking the jams out of, it's fucking insufferable, dude. It's so fucking insufferable. It's so silly. Kick out the jams. <laughs> I love it so much, but God damn it. Um, yeah, it's a book that is really hard to fucking read. It likes to play tricks on its readers. It likes to, it's a puzzle box in and of itself, but it's a puzzle box with no solution. It's a mind fuck. It's, yeah. The idea is that the justified ancients of Mumu represent chaos and they are, they are at war with order or control. And that's the important part. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. So producing a play out of this was fucking impossible, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ken Campbell's line that he would give, you know, the through line to all this was, is it heroic? Was his, like, main direction that he would give other people. And, like... Honestly, it's heroic to even try to pull it off. Yep. And, uh, you know, Bill Drummond, like, painted that in his workspace building the set. Is it heroic in big, like, red letters and shit? And apparently, like, Ken Campbell's a really respected director. And, uh, you know, he pushed Bill Drummond to make this insane set that played with perspective and used all these insane tricks to mind fuck the audience mm. and it was apparently fucking genius wow i wish yeah. i could see it i know um well you can you can check out i'm sure the play has been filmed like a uh but giving the seemingly contradictory scales of the story in the cafe stage yeah, like Jim Broadbent uh, recalled the production of Illuminatus working on a, quote, genius level. It wasn't that Ken was being a genius. It was the whole creation of doing the greatest show yet done on planet world. His creative imagination was just stunning. It was also a huge success. The success of the play led to like a moving south to London and a sold out run at the National Theater in uh, March of 1977. That's super cool. Yeah. It also featured Robert Anton Wilson him himself, whose job... Uh, was to lie naked in the center of the stage, shouting, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Fuck yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't need to have all of your loose ends completely tied to put on a good production. You really don't. Because you can go to Broadway and you can see the same play that's been running for the last 40 years and you know what you're going to get. You know that play. Yeah. What's a more tantalizing experience? That or something that you've never seen anything like before. Exactly. And something that will never... That's the beauty of plays, too. Yeah, is that man. once you see them, that performance is done and will never happen again. Yep. Oh, movie I, you can rewatch. It'll be the same. I Play, love, never. I love shit. Yeah. I fucking love it, it. It's so beautiful in its ephemeral nature. Hell yeah. Robert Anton Wilson also brought a bunch of acid to that. Well, yeah. Yeah. And he offered it to the cast before they went on stage. Uh, actor Bill Nye was in this fucking thing he recalled that uh everyone went very quiet and then yeah why not thanks and we all dived in so we were all tripping it's a terrible idea if you want to act but there you are and this was even more difficult because now you had a, a scene with neil cunningham where they had to act tripping the characters <laughs> were tripping yeah oh man yeah that's gotta be trippy so now you asked how do we act tripping as we already are anyway uh, Cunningham suggested that they just stand there and hold hands. 
So that's what they did. That is what people on drugs would do. Fucking they are tripping. You don't have to act. Yeah. So you've got this big, ridiculous production happening on this amazing set that Bill Drummond designed, right? Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. Bill Drummond wasn't even, he wasn't there. He wasn't in London. Um, before yeah, like went, he didn't attend the performances or anything? No, no, no. But see, before they went south and like Robert Anton Wilson was giving everyone acid and shit, like right before the premiere when uh, this, all the sets were done and shit, uh, Bill Drummond said that he, he announced he was going to, he had to go out and get some glue. No, he just never came back. Just, Where'd he go? He went and started uh, the band Big in Japan. And tried to, he just he just decided he, his job was done. He was like, ah, it's not my thing. I'm just going to put Cool. Off. Yeah, he just fucked off. You did, I love that for him. Yeah, hell yeah. So, <laughs> so, all right, my time here is done. Yeah. Sayonara. Yep, made sure he completed the set first, you know. Wonderful. Yeah, he, was, he just wasn't even there. But he would then go on to try his own hand at making the impossible possible. The spirit of Eris never did leave him. She never does. Nope. While, man- while managing both Echo and the Bunnymen and the teardrop explodes, Drummond was thinking about the different aesthetic and symbolic resonances of the two bands. The teardrop explodes is a stupid name. I'm sorry. See, that was Bill Drummond's favorite fucking... Th- he loved it so much. He thought it was the greatest thing. Like... I think it's... I don't like it. Yeah. I mean, me neither. But it kind of has that, like, neo-psychedelia feel i don't know maybe it was, maybe it hit different in 78 yeah yeah well in in drummond's mind echo and the bunny men were cold austere implacable right like like iceland mm-hmm. you know and the teardrop explodes were wild and unpredictable like the jungles of papua new guinea which drummond had never been to but he was like obsessed with it and imagined it was beautiful he he wanted to arrange he wanted to arrange a day where at the same time Echo and the Bunnymen would take the stage in Reykjavik, Iceland, and the Teardrop Explodes would take the stage in Papua New Guinea. Okay. And Bill Drummond, well, he would stand on his favorite manhole cover somewhere in England, and something would happen. Well? Well, the Teardrop Explodes was too far gone into acid casualty territory to be persuaded to fly to the jungles of Papua New Guinea. However, Echo and the Bunnymen were chill, and they, they did go to Reykjavik, and they Played a show in Iceland, and uh, despite only half the operation going into effect, Drummond did stand on the manhole cover, and nothing happened, though. Yeah. Gotta try. I respect it. <laughs> so, shortly after Teardrop Explodes collapsed, Bunnymen got signed to a major record label. Bill Drummond went to work as an A&R man for a record company. Nothing A&R? Had... A&R is uh, Artist Repertoire. Okay. It's, uh, they, they're scouts. Okay. Yeah. But nothing interesting happened until 1987, really, when Drummond was dissatisfied with life, hated the music industry. He was 33 and a third years old, which is was symbolic because that's the speed a record spins at. He was depressed. He didn't give a fucking shit about anything except making art and climbing mountains. Fuck all the rest of it. Which, apart from that, like having a fairly high paying career, that's me. (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't even realize that until I was writing this. I'm like, I'm exactly where this <laughs> fucking ass is. Well, in 1987, Drummond returned to live at his parents' house. He quit the music industry, and he wrote a sad boy acoustic album called The Man that, <laughs> that no one could tell if it was satire or in earnest. It was probably both, but it probably doesn't matter. He also started writing a book called Why Andy Warhol is Shite. <laughs> but he got distracted by a sudden urge to pick up Illuminatus again. He started reading it again, and he had this idea. He uh, he called up a feller he knew, uh, Jimmy Cotty, who he had tried to get in one of his weird concept bands that never took off, a band called Brilliant that they spent way too much fucking money on, and he told them that they needed to start a hip-hop group called The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. Uh, Willow, would you please read this? It was New Year's Day, 1987. I was at home with my parents. I was going for a walk in the morning. It was like bright blue sky. And I thought, I'm going to make a hip-hop record. Who can I make a hip-hop record with? I wasn't brave enough to go and do it myself, because although I can play the guitar and I can knock out a few things on the piano, I knew nothing, personally, about the technology. And I thought, I knew Jimmy. I knew he was a like spirit. We share similar tastes and backgrounds and music and things. So I phoned him up that day and said, let's form a band called the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. And he knew exactly, to coin a phrase, where I was coming from. 
<laughs> Within a week, we had recorded our first single. To coin a phrase. Um, so a John Higgs uh, writes that a simplified description of their partnership, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Cotty and Bill Drummond, would portray Cotty as the musician and Drummond as the strategist, but that view doesn't hold up to scrutiny. All the products of their partnership, whether musical or otherwise, came out of the mutu- came out of mutual agreement. Cotty is just as capable as, of burning stuff as Drummond. Any difference in their roles comes down to their individual characters. Cotty is practical and above all curious, quick to get his hands dirty, experiment and see what happens. He is a catalyst. Drummond, on the other hand, is not so much curious, but driven. The difficulty of defining exactly how he is driven is what makes this narrative spend more time on him. I just, I love the portrayal of Bill Drummond in this book as just this truly insane person that can make shit happen. Yeah. Beautiful. And it's also part of the myth building and shit, right? Like, mm-hmm. Welsh music writer Richard King described the partnership as an as having an almost telepathic way of communicating. Cody said they never had to discuss anything because they there was never any disagreement on music or anything. It was quite weird, actually, Cody said. So... Cody had actually seen Ken Campbell's production of Illuminatus. He was actually there, <laughs> which is funny. And he knew that the name would represent the principle of chaos working against the corporate music industry. A guerrilla band of musical anarchists who existed to disrupt, confuse, and destroy. But really, the reason Drummond called Cody is because he had a sampler, right? And for their desire to fuck up the music industry, hip-hop was a good fit. You know, this is 1987. Hip-hop wasn't... They weren't real bands, right? Uh, it wasn't. There were no songs. It was wasn't even interested in singing. Mm-hmm. There was no need for virtuoso musicians. They stole chunks of other people's records and smashed them together. It was anti music at the time, and this is the thing that the jams would end up being known for: sampling, stealing shit, ripping shit off, and repurposing it for their own ends. Sampling was originally about, like, finding a groove or a sound that worked and using that to build a sonic collage that sounded good. Because that's what music's about, right? Sounding good and shit. The jams, on the other hand, were more, to borrow a phrase from Robert Anton Wilson, guerrilla ontologists. Their sampling was, at the beginning, less about what the sample sounded like than what it represented. Using ABBA or a Beatles sample, whole sections of songs, in fact... Because they were ABBA or the Beatles, rather than because of what it sounded like. Right? That's so interesting. Right, but like everyone today is like, yeah, 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 no shit, right? Mm-hmm. But that was new as fuck in the music world, you know? And the Jam's first single was called All You Need Is Love, which started with the first 15 seconds of the Beatles' All You Need Is Love that slowly slowed down and faded into nothingness before the crash and kick out the Jam's motherfuckers of the MC5. And then it turned out that this All You Need Is Love was... Bill Drummond <laughs> rapping in a ramped up Scottish accent about AIDS. Oh my Let's god. Let's take a listen. I love this. It's disarming. Oh, yeah. It's, it's aggressive as fuck in its own way. Um, yeah. It's a hell of a thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, John Higgs draws on the concept of detournement. I, I don't actually know how to pronounce that. some French bullshit. It's like det- detournement. Well, it's a concept in situationist thinking that, that basically means repurposing the images of culture for our own ends. Right? That's something we all get now. There's there's a situationist concept I, that I think is important and I, I really like. It's called the spectacle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the spectacle is the deluge of images and representations of things that we are all drowning in. It's also that which we build our boats out of. It's the spectacle. It's the entire semiotic ecosystem of consumer capitalism, right? 
As John Higgs puts it, the spectacle can be thought of as the overwhelming representation of all that is real. In the simplest possible terms, it can be understood as being mass media, but that simple definition should really be expanded to include our entire culture and our social relations. The spectacle is both the end result of and the justification for our consumerist society. The spectacle draws our attention away from what is real to what is merely a representation. The situation has saw in our culture a shift in our focus from being to having, and then from having to appearing to have. This absorption in the image of things, they felt, was the cause of our modern alienation. The Situationists were not keen on the spectacle, it is the central idea at the heart of their self-referential reality tunnel. The thinking behind Situationist detournments goes like this. Every day we are bombarded by adverts, images, songs, or videos. They are part of the spectacle of the system, distractions that keep us numb and alienated. Importantly, we get these whether we want them or not, for it is almost impossible to live in the modern world and not be subject to this bombardment. They are a form of psychic pollution, one which is forced on us by capitalists. As we cannot escape from this onslaught, the Situationists argued, our only honorable response is to fuck with it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The tournament, then, is the switching of context to switch the meaning. So when the Jams start their first record with a snippet of All You Need Is Love, this is no mere sampling. The way they ended the sample, by slowing down the final love, 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 until it collapsed into nothing, can only be seen as a rejection. This was a statement of intent. It was about claiming and then dismissing the height of the Beatles, and by extension, pop music as a whole. Such were the ambitions and the acts of the two men who had taken on the name The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. Seriously, fucking read John Higgs' book about this. It's so fucking good. And further, they were, you know, directly juxtaposing the age of AIDS against the halcyon and misremembered glory days of the summer of love, right? Mm-hmm. Fucking brilliant. Hard to say it was intentional, though. Sorcery, not wizardry. The jams really existed only for the year 1987. Two albums. Oh, what can you do? You know, the uh, the second album was more dancey than hip hoppy. Uh, the The jams press agent said drummond came up and played me the jams and i thought it was absolute rubbish i just couldn't take it seriously because it was a racket it was bill drummond pretending to be some kind of glaswegian dock worker over a load of abba samples and i thought it was complete tosh seriously i really did and i may or may not have said that to him <laughs> drummond and Cody had taken on the pseudonyms king boy d and rock man rock oh my god <laughs> And despite having what a lot of people considered to be a piece of shit record, they had something far more important. Mythos. Their lyrics were filled with references to something about a 20,000-year feud. Someone was justified. Someone was ancient. Illuminatus was still very much underground, and hell, most people can't get through it. I did, and I think I deserve a purple heart for my own service as a girl ontologist. You do. Yes. Adding to the myth was the fact that the reality it was the fact that the record was hard to find. Because all sorts of record labels were making moves to shut them down, considering <laughs> they were just taking entire sections of songs from the likes of the Beatles and ABBA in, like, 1987. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the legal issues came to a head when ABBA themselves wanted to sue them. The Jams thought that, well, if they just went and had a chat with ABBA, they could sort, sort this whole thing out, smooth things over. Well. So they drove to Sweden to try and have a chat with ABBA. Well, they got to Stockholm, they couldn't find him. Oh, you don't say. They couldn't find ABBA, so they couldn't give ABBA the gold record they had commissioned to celebrate zero sales. So they gave it to a random sex worker who sort of looked like one of the members of ABBA. Then they drove home. They stopped on the way to burn the trunk full of their records in some farmer asshole's field. The farmer chased them off by shooting at them. Then on the way back to England on the North Sea Ferry, they threw the remainder of the records overboard and then played one of the handful of live shows they ever played. On the ferry. So it goes. Huh. Didn't play a lot of live shows. <clears throat> DJ shit. You know, like... A lot of live up. shows. They did some, and they were like spectacles, and they showed up at like raves to do live sets, but most of their live playing was like playing a tape and doing a performance. But they did do, do a few. But this was the start of Drummond and Cotty's reputations as being masters of the publicity stunt. Higgs writes that it's worth noting the gulf between this reputation and how they actually behaved. Uh, the, tra the traditional role of media manipulators is a scheming, cynical one, where intricate plans are mapped out in advance and followed to the letter. In contrast, the jams are simply winging it. The impetus 
here was that they had to destroy the stock, their stock of the album, and they wanted to make that act a thing in itself, something symbolic and interesting. Beyond that, they were scrabbling around for ideas and just trying to make something happen. Hindsight may fix these events into a narrative that makes them appear symbolic or almost preordained, such as the way the bonfire of their debut album mirrors the later bonfire of their money. But while they are being enacted, they are chaotic. They lack aim and purpose. To quote one of their press releases, the plot has been mislaid. Like, another of the jam singles was basically Bill Drummond asking Whitney Houston to please baby, please join the jams. Yeah. Like, and then just like the entirety of Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody. Wow. Because they just loved that song. It is a great song. Great song. I love that yeah, song. Dude. Yeah. They released two records as the jams. The first titled 1987, What the Fuck is Going On? Uh, is, is the Scottish hip hop one. But on their second posthumously released album, Who Killed the Jams? They started fucking with dance music. And that included a version of what would be their last and like greatest song. But we'll get to that. Then, however, they dropped the name The Jams, The Justified Ancients of Moo Moo, like as their name, but they never actually dropped it as their true name. Mm -hmm. they, they did this like on their own record label too, which they called KLF Communications for Copyright Liberation Front. What was their new name? So first they were the jams on KLF Communications records. Then they dropped it and then they um they wanted to write a, a hit. So they made an extremely stupid, cheesy arena dance rock song based off the theme from Doctor Who mashed up with stolen Gary Glitter. Oh my god. Oh uh, yeah. John Hugg's book goes into great detail about all the synchro mystic associations around even the existence of Doctor Who. But I'm an American, and to speak too much on that would be cultural appropriation, and we don't have time. <laughs> no. no, we don't. <laughs> the point is that they made a song that was number one in England for a week in, like, about mashing up the fucking, like, 20th century emergent creation of the BBC itself, which is, like, sort of what Doctor Who was. There are a lot of weird synchronicities around Doctor Who. But it was incredibly stupid. It was number one in England for a week. It was mm -hmm. a novelty song. Talking to the press, they said it was written by their car, a Ford police cruiser they called the Ford Time Lord. Um, and they did the record under the name The Time Lords. They rigged up the car so they could give interviews with like flashing lights and the voice coming out of the, the grill. Oh, that's brilliant. It's great. It was pure novelty. And they got fucking paid. Let's take a listen. It's so stupid. It's called Doctor in the TARDIS. I will say the way they incorporated the actual Doctor Who theme and the very signature sounds from that show is actually fucking genius. The mixing is really nice. It's fucking ridiculous. They got fucking paid for that. Then they wrote a book called The Manual, How to Have a Number One the Easy Way. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Well, this seems like a cynical fuck you. It is, in fact, a hundred page fucking manual in small typeface about how to write a number one the easy way. A quote from the section on how to write a chorus. The lyrics for the chorus must never deal with anything but the most basic of human emotions. 
This is not us trying to be cynical in a clever sort of way when we say stick to the cliches. The cliches are cliches because they deal with the emotional topics we all feel. No records are bought in vast quantities because the lyrics are intellectually clever or deal in strange and new ideas. In fact, the lyrics can be quite meaningless in a literal sense, but still have a great emotional pull. An obvious example of this was the chorus of our own record. Doctor Who. Hey. Doctor Who. Doctor Who. In the TARDIS. Doctor Who. Hey. <laughs> Doctor Who. Doctor Who. What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? Yeah. I was literally just thinking that. <laughs> now, not only would the KLF later use their own manual to write another number one, but multiple other bands have used it too, including uh, Claxons, who had two records who were, which were both like 85% insanely good, and then a third record, which is the biggest piece of shit I've ever heard. But you know what? They also got fucking paid. Like Jamie Reynolds of the Claxons told American mu music journalist Philip Sherburn, that they followed the book religiously in order to make their Mercury award-winning first album. Quote, that's what I did. That's genuinely it. I read that. I noted down the golden rules of pop and applied that to what we were doing and made sure that that always applies to everything we do. The Claxons then went on to drop acid and perform with Rihanna in a laser and neon pyramid at the 2008 Brit Awards. Yeah, there was like a fucking uh, Swedish band, I think, that also did that and fucking wrote a, a ridiculous number one. Stupid song that everyone hated, but it got him fucking paid. Apparently, the book worked. So, I'm going to read that. It's actually, like, it, it is really interesting. I grabbed a stupid quote from it, but, like, it doesn't seem like a joke. Then the rave scene took over England. And uh, changing their name once more, they went from being the Time Lords to KLF, which was just a great series of three letters for a fucking house band mm -hmm. right? it's mysterious it just looks right klf they made this logo that was you know the pyramid with a boom box for eyes you know it wasn't the the eye on top of the pyramid wasn't observing anymore it was broadcasting which is the is the thing yes yeah i love it but they actually like instead of like immediately following the man the manual and just like getting more paid they had an earnest love of fucking rave and not that their love of music was any was ever anything but earnest it was the most earnest and most genuine love of pop music that allowed them to tell the rest of it to fuck off but they started delving into the like the least commercially viable form of ecstasy music and one of my favorites like ambient house yes yeah they released a few songs that would later become hits uh as the quote pure trance transversions first starting with a a track called What Time Is Love before it had uh, lyrics. This was... All right. We're going to hear that song a bunch more times in different forms, but that was in fucking 1988. 19 fucking 88, well before anyone else was doing that, like, like that's some, like, late 90s trance shit. The title, What Time Is Love, referred to when Drummond was taking ecstasy and tried to ask what time it would kick in, and he said, what time is love? And they knew they were on ecstasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this, like, it's good, but it's kind of just good electronic music, you know, different podcasts, but in typical KLF fashion, like, some of the songs that had the pure trance versions would end up being reworked into their, you know, number one single giant fuck off stadium house versions in KLF's last act, including 3AM Eternal and Last Train to Trans Central. They released an album called Chill Out, which is fucking fantastic. It's not called that anymore because they got sued to shit and had to remove a bunch of samples. Now it's on streaming services as Baltimore to Fair Play is what it's called. Oh. It's tight as fuck. It's like wicked and like... All, all the lyrics were about like places in America that Bill Drummond had never gone to, but he just imagined. Oh, yeah, and, like the names of yeah, it's a uh, it's wild. In 1989, they made a movie called The White Room, which we will talk about more. The soundtrack to which was released in 1991 as an album, The White Room. It's also just so fucking goddamn good. But this was some of the ambient. This is one of the ambient uh, things. So like. 
when they the white room is like their one and only like it was chill out and then the white room where the album is as the klf and like we were saying earlier like singles bands they've got the three songs that are like the bangers and then shit that's filler yeah this was the three singles the stadium house fucking bangers right at the front and then a whole album of weird experimental down tempo shit cool that was just beautiful and like this this track is called uh madrugada eterna and it's like i don't even know fucking good i enjoyed that and like that was uh they had a a lap steel player who was just on a ton of their non-singles music like that's that's not sampled you know it's just so fucking good which i realize is subjective but whatever it's tight as fuck <laughs> caudy was also a founding member of the orb Ooh. yeah and uh good orb yeah he uh, along with he, he founded the orb along with alex patterson and uh patterson claimed that um a lot of a lot of like the stuff on chill out was just ripped off dj sets of of his yeah <laughs> maybe sour grapes are maybe completely fucking on brand so the movie the white room which was never like really released it's about drummond and Cotty getting into their ford time lord and driving around it's a weird art road movie but it's a little more than that it starts with them getting into the car and there's a solicitor in the back a legal job he's got the paper he's soliciting you for a signature on some shit he gives them a contract, which they sign without reading. The The solicitor gets out, and at two points in the film, they stop and, on their road trip and build a fire and camp out somewhere. And the solicitor is seen appearing in the smoke in the flames, studying the contract. The second time, this obvious stand-in for the devil or one of his agents, like, spots a clause in the contract and, and writes on it, quote, liberation loophole, exclamation point. Yeah. And then this very obviously excites Drummond and Cotty. They drive into the mountains. The car gets stuck in the snow and they have to abandon it and continue on foot. Eventually, they reach the summit where they discover a large white building with a radio telescope. They go in. They find themselves in a white smoke-filled void, the white room. And here there is a pair of fake mustaches on a pedestal, which they attach to their faces. Then they meet the solicitor sitting at a white table. He shows them the clause he has found in the contract. They nod. The pair then walk away, dissolving into the smoke and vanishing into the void. Wow. So, like, there's legitimately some, like, underlying mythology that they, that was, like, behind the Goofy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's, there's some shit. Like, I, they never mentioned or wrote about or talked about, like, magic or mystic shit or whatever. But when they turned into the KLF, there, there did start to be this religious orientation towards something. Like, there was the joke of them being the justified ancients of Mumu. With their, you know, the ridiculous secret society shit. But there absolutely is this underlying religious yearning within the music of the KLF. I mean, you could fucking hear it in that slide guitar, dude. You know, there's something there. Well, What Time Is Love actually became a bit of an underground rave hit. Uh, the pair made a few live appearances at raves at the um, 1989 Helter Skelter rave in Chipping Norton. The pair climbed into a lighting gantry and emptied out a bin bag containing a thousand pounds in Scottish one-pound notes, which was their appearance fee, over the dancing crowd beneath them. They just 
gave away their money to the people. As they should. As they should. Uh, at the, but then at an appearance uh, at the Liverpool Festival of Comedy in 1991, the pair distributed ice creams to the crowd from an ice cream van. Hell yeah, again. At a 1990 appearance at the Paradiso Club in Amsterdam, the pair performed a 23-minute ver- uh, long version of What Time Is Love, during which they gave most of the infr- instruments and mixing equipment to the crowd. <laughs> uh, none of this belonged to them. It was the clubs. They were not invited back. Yeah. Yeah, they just stole the club's shit and gave it away. Oops. Yeah. I don't think it was an oops. I think they just did it. The idea for the white room, like, spiraled out of control and got too big for their britches. They started incorporating this, like, second layer of mythology around, like, the idea that this fan was hired by the justified, the actual justified agents of Mumu, and he tried to assassinate them while they were filming, and all this shit that just got a little too fucking much. And they also, like, wanted to hire real actors and, like, write this whole plot about the assassination into the into the script. And, uh, yeah, it just, it just went a little fucking off the rails, and they never finished it. But halfway through, when they needed some other fucking money, that was when they made the decision that they'd be become known for, that they would be... They were just going to make fucking hit singles. And uh, I was in 1990, and uh, they released a press briefing... Something which is like dry as fuck and most people overlook in February 1990 that was titled Information Sheet 8. Very grabbing title. Yeah. And like within it was uh, some interesting passages. The justified ancients of Mumu are an organization or disorganization who are at least as old as the Illuminati. They represent the primeval power of chaos. As such, they are diametrically opposed to the order that the Illuminati try to oppress on mankind and on mankind's understanding of the universe. The Jams took on that mantle in order to make records without anyone telling them how it should be done. But within days of their first record being released, they began to receive mail and messages from very strange sources. The information they were getting, the information they were getting was varied and confusing. They were being warned not to get involved with what they could never understand. They were being threatened. They were being congratulated in taking the war above ground. They were being welcomed on board as brothers in arms in the only war that was ever justified. I quote, To finally separate time from space, thus enabling chaos once again to reign supreme. (laughs) Amen. Yeah. The uh, solicitor was sent a contract with an organization or individual calling themselves Eternity. The wording of this contract was that of standard music business legal speak, but the terms discussed and the rights required and granted were of a far stranger kind. Whether the contract was a very clever and intricate prank by a legal-minded jams fan was of little concern to Drummond and Cotty. For them, it was as good a marker as anything as to what direction their freestyle career should take next. In the first term of the contract, they, Drummond and Cotty, were required to make an artistic representation of themselves on a journey to a place called the White Room. The medium they chose to make this representation was up to them. Where or what the White Room was was never clearly defined. Interpretation was left to their own creativity. The remuneration they are to receive on completion of this work of art was supposed to be access to the real White Room. It's interesting that this is also when Twin Peaks was on the air with the the Red Room and the White Lodge and the Black Lodge and shit. The, so the, the liberation loophole phrase from the White Room was something that appeared in KLF lyrics like over and over again. And it was a extension of Bill Drummond's personal mantra that he adopted when he was a kid, which was, accept the contradictions. Um, yes. Yes. He uh, wrote in 1997, uh, Willow, if you please. Something may appear to be one thing, but then turn out to be the opposite. Or how something could be what it is and the... Or how something could be what it is and its opposite at the same time. This chimed with a contradiction I had long felt to be at the heart of human existence, that we are totally trapped and totally free at the same time. I decided to accept the total contradiction that everything from the Big Bang to the end of time is preordained in every sense, and that we're totally free to do whatever the fuck we want. Hell yes. Again, amen. Yep, exactly. So 1990 was KLF's big year for singles with uh, the three, the Stadium House trilogy, as it was called, which they made these ridiculous music videos using Drummond's stage design um, expertise, all of which featured them performing at this fictional location with like 
these model setups and shit, like model cities, a model train, a model pyramid stage, but then also like a real stage with a pyramid of background singers and them in fucking robes and sunglasses and shit, taking a fucking uh, circular saw to synthesizers on stage, just spraying the imaginary crowd with sparks and shit. It's bad shit, and it's so cool. Brilliant. Yeah. The first of the single was the updated What Time Is Love, now with with lyrics, which I'm only going to... It's not the best, but I'm only going to play it because there's a third version that we're going to have to hear, and that's just amazing. That song's whatever, honestly. However, then they released uh, the song that would be their first actual number one single. And this shit fucking slaps. This is uh, 3 a.m. Eternal. Actually, come over here and watch the video of this. But yeah, so this is... This fucking song, 3 a.m. Eternal, uh, reached number one in the UK and number five in the US. which for like a while like it was a fucking hit right and it features uh mc ricardo de force who's an unappreciated and adds the spice oh excellent yeah but like this was a fucking huge hit right this is radio freedom Right. Thank you. Yes. Like, y'all listening can't see the, the visuals. I recommend checking it out. There's this, none of this should work. It should be, like, let me ask you, Willa. Are you down with the crew crew talking about the moo moo? <laughs> that was my favorite line. Yes. It's the self-satisfied look on Ricardo the Force's Like, face. lean into the silliness. Yeah. People like it. But make it good. But make it good. really good. 
Like, and it's worth knowing that like all these singles that did so fucking well are all like repurposed bits of old songs. Like the, the ancients of Moo Moo is like in every single one of their singles. A mm-hmm. lot, there's a lot of shit that's in every single one. A fucking, it's this like repeating. Signature. Yeah. And it's just repeating these like mem- memetic signatures and shit and like taking these old ideas and just con- constantly refining and refining and refining in, in this like fucked up rock tumbler. Right. Which, like, John Higgs speculates that Bill Drummond has OCD, and it's like, yeah, probably. It's <laughs> how that shit works. It's just what, what happens. It's beautiful. Like, I just, I love this type of, of art making so fucking much. Just this commitment to quality while at the same time just not giving a fuck about whether something's serious enough or, like, it's just, is it cool, you know? It's fucking sick. Is now, it a vibe? It's a fucking vibe, dude. Now, when these singles were, like, released, they were a known qual- quantity, and, you know, like, Earlier, when they were the, the Justified Ancient Moo Moo, they had like done shit like graffitiing lyrics on billboards before their shit was released and stuff like that. <laughs> they reworked that. The reason I already played What Time Is Love twice already is just so you can understand the most ridiculous shit I've ever seen with one version uh, called America, What Time Is Love. And this is like this black and white video of this like Viking ship on the ocean and there's like rain and like fucking people dancing. It's the t- stupid high budget. just. Just, it's obscene. It's obscene. In the year of our Lord, 992, the justified ancients of Mumu set sail in their long boats on a voyage to rediscover the lost continent. After many months on perilous, stormy seas, their search was fruitless. Just when all seemed lost, they discovered America. <laughs> <laughs> The music you are about to experience is a celebration of the 1,000th anniversary of their founding of this great Fucking sick. They're like on a pirate they're on a Viking boat. They're wearing crusader helmets. It's raining. There's <laughs> fucking Glenn Hughes is just singing his brains out. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And I like how it went like that song went from this like trance groove to okay, it's a single, to okay, it's the most ridiculous shit you've ever heard in your life. I I love it. So on the summer solstice. 1991, they invited a bunch of journalists to the island of Jura in Scotland. Um, here they boarded a... They, they were asked to arrive at Heathrow Airport with their passports. They, here they boarded a specially chartered plane, which would take them, uh, they were told, to a ceremony in the Lost Kingdom of Moo. 
the plane actually took them up to Scotland uh, to the Isle of Islay in the Inner Hebrides, and a coach and a ferry took them to the neighboring island of Jura. The customs officer who greeted them on Jura was Bill Drummond. He sat behind a desk wearing a false mustache and dressed in the uniform of a customs officer. He stamped each of their passports with the Pyramid Blaster logo. The journalists were then dressed in robes and led across the island in a silent procession. At the head of this procession was a figure in, a white, with a, in white with a single horn emerging from its hood. Yeah. He led them towards their final destination, a 60-foot-tall wicker man surrounded by a hidden sound system. They formed a circle around the figure. Here they were addressed by Drummond, although his true identity was masked by the robe and horn. Thanks to a microphone under his hood, his words were being mixed into the trance-like rave music that the hidden sound system around them was pumping out. The circle of robed journalists chanted while Drummond preached at them in an improvised and meaningless language of his own devising. Uh, Cotty said, I had a little radio mic on Bill, and I was working the mix. He was up on a sort of platform in front of the wicker man, dressed with his horn, and did the whole speech in a foreign language he'd just made up. It was totally, totally brilliant. Everyone was completely gobsmacked. Fuck yeah. At the finale of what Cotty called this whole sort of fake pagan ceremony, the wicker man was lit. Yeah, yeah. The original Burning Man. Yep. It was a powerful looking figure. It did not stand to attention like the one in the Wicker Man film or those found in historical woodcuts. It had both arms thrust aloft and its legs spaced heroically apart, giving it the aspect of a four-pointed star about to pounce. It didn't smolder or smoke, but instead blazed straight upwards in a huge column of fire. That would, like, Jesus Christ, guys. That's cool. Yeah. Then they released uh, their last hit, which reached number two on the chart. It was called Justified and Ancient. It featured fucking Tammy Wynette, the first lady of country music. Tammy, Tammy Wynette did, she did fucking Stand By Your Man. Yes, great song. Yeah. Like, that's, she's a, a fucking legend. But if you love him, you'll forgive him. Even though he's hard to understand. Yeah, so <laughs> Tammy Wynette was was a, a grandma at this point. She was she was elderly at this at this point. Tammy fucking Wynette. This song, which had been done before uh, on a, a jams record, but this version relies on a sample of Jimi Hendrix's "Voodoo Child." Right? It, it originally wasn't working, and, and Cody uh, frustrated said, "You know what we need? You know who we need on this track? Tammy Wynette as a, as a joke." Bill Drummond uh, got on the phone, and being a former a and man, knowing all these people, he made contact with Tammy Wynette, who was very confused, but thought it would be fun. Later, when they were filming the absolutely batshit video that features a whole bunch of people partying on the sinking Isle of Moo, with Tammy Wynette as the queen of Moo atop a pyramid in this beautiful flowing gown, while Drummond and Cotty are in robes with giant fucking horns in their heads instead of visible faces, with a scrolling text listing all of Tammy Wynette's accomplishments, before the Caliph get into a submarine and fuck off as the island of Moo is destroyed. While they were filming, Cotty said, Hey, who's that old lady? <laughs> because he had confused Tammy Wynette for Dolly Parton. He wanted Dolly Parton. He thought they were getting Dolly Parton. Oh my God. But it's so much better with Tammy Wynette. Uh, and it's one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And like, again, it shouldn't work. Nothing about this should work. It's the dumbest thing anyone has ever done. And it. Fucking rules.
That song is an incredible piece of art. Again, disarming, but brilliant. And there's like a hidden depth in those fucking like lyrics and shit. You know, just like this ridiculous thing, but then hanging it on, you know, at the end of fucking uh, Ricardo's verse, like fishing in the rivers of life, fishing in the river. Like there's a thing that they are actually not trying to say. They're saying it. But saying it underneath all this spectacle, right? There's there's a fucking... The Hierophant is very present throughout all of this shit. You know what I mean? But we're not there yet. KLF, with that song, were the biggest, were the best-selling singles band in the world. That was Tammy Wynette, the first lady of country music's last fucking chart topper. I reached number two in the UK charts and was like, um, it was in like the top five in like 11 other countries. Again, a huge fucking hit, right? That was Tammy Wynette's last hit. That's crazy. That's insane. Well, they had literally fucking done it through nothing but sheer goddamn insanity. Through chasing vibes alone, which meant there was only one thing that could happen next. At the uh, 1992 Brit Awards, they won like Best Singles Act or something. And the plan was to just completely torch the entire idea of KLF. The first idea they had was for Drummond to uh, cut off his own hand and throw it into the crowd. And the way everyone retells this, it seems like he might have actually been planning on doing that, but they didn't. Instead, uh, what, the next idea was to spray the audience with pig's blood. <laughs> they didn't do that either. Yeah, that's a good a good yeah. call. Uh, instead, they got the aggressive and ugly punk band Extreme Noise Terror to to cover their number one chart topper, 3 a.m. Eternal. <laughs> it's terrible. It's so aggressive and ugly and just... Bleh. Then Drummond took a fucking machine gun and walked on stage and fired a clip of blanks into the audience, which... Is just like regular bullets, except for the bullet part, but it sounds and looks exactly the fucking same. So to for all intents and purposes, at first glance, that man was firing a machine gun into the crowd. Then they ran away. They fucked off. <laughs> <laughs> they had gotten a dead sheep um, from that they got from a butcher's. Like, they didn't kill the sheep. They just bought a dead sheep from the butcher's. But they hung a sign around its neck that said, I died for you, E-W-E. A little, a little pun. Uh, and then they just dropped it at the entrance of the after party, and then they fucked off. <laughs> then they wrote a contract in paint on top of their, their car that said they were not allowed to make any music for 23 years. <laughs> then they pushed the car off the cliff to sign it, because that's just how you got to sign things sometimes. You know? Yeah. Um, it's one way to leave your signature. Then they released a statement saying they were deleting their entire fucking catalog. And they did. From 1992 until 2021, you could not buy nor stream the KLF or the jams in any legal way. Beautiful. Yeah. A press release said, uh, We have been following a wild and wounded, glum and glorious, shit but shining path these past five years. The last of two, which has led us up onto the commercial high ground. We are at a point where the path is about to take a sharp turn from these sunny uplands down into the nether world of we know not what. 
For the foreseeable future, there will be no further record releases from the Justified Ancients of Moo, the Time Lords, the KLF, or any other past, present, and future name attached to our activities. As of now, all our past releases are deleted. If we meet further along, be prepared. Our disguise may be complete. Rebranding themselves as the K Foundation, they did a couple art things briefly, like nailing a thousand dollars to inside of a frame and then auctioning it off as a piece of art. Or when uh, this woman was named like Britain's best artist and given a $20,000 prize, they awarded her Britain's worst artist and gave her a $40,000 prize. Just because it's funny that being the worst artist was worth twice as much as the best. And they were just giving away their fucking money. Then they did the thing that will forever haunt them and forever solidify themselves as either Discordian saints or huge fucking douchebags, depending on who you ask. Except the contradictions. They made a film. The film was with one camera. It was Drummond and Cotty and a friend in an abandoned seaside house. The house had a fireplace. Drummond and Cotty had their last one million pounds. Over the course of 45 minutes, they burned the fuck out of that million pounds. It was in five grand increments. Lit that bitch up, they did. Just slowly, 45 minutes, lit a million pounds on fire. Then they toured the film. Like, one stop for touring the film was at Alan Moore's house. The comic writer, the magician. He fucking loved the KLF, by the way. He loved everything they did. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot. He shows up a lot more in the book, uh, the KLF. Uh, that makes sense. That checks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people thought they were cunts for that. <laughs> thought they were huge fucking dickheads. I mean, like, I understand why. It's funny but... that you do, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they could have donated it. You know, they could have given it yeah, to some artist. Yeah, they could have. They could have done a lot of things. But it's so good every other fucking asshole that buys a yacht. Right. I mean, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, it's fucking fake anyway. And according to them, they have no idea why they did it. But they had to. And they regret it every single day. But they had to. It's only funny if you do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They did sort of break the contract with a 23-minute live show of sorts, of sorts, in 1997 with, like, a big screen projection of Tammy Wynette and, like, a big production. It's great. In 2017, they wrote a book that was sort of like a the Illuminatus, but their version of the Illuminatus, it was not well received. But in 2021, KLF's music started appearing on streaming services for the first time. It was preceded by like posters going up in London subway, like Gorilla, Gorilla marketing, with just the fucking Pyramid Blaster logo and shit. They're sell- now selling posters for their tour in the year 2323 and say that in the future they've built the People's Pyramid. The fuckers are still around and still committed to the bit. And that 23 years is coming up. They better fucking do something. They're still around. In a 2000 review of Drummond's book 45 and an appraisal of the duo's career to date, writer Stephen Poole stated that Drummond and Cotty are the only true conceptual artists of the 1990s. And for all the eldritch beauty of their art, their most successful creation is the myth that they've built around themselves. A myth like the KLF's is peculiarly omnivorous. Just as there can never be any evidence to disprove a conspiracy theory because the fabrication of such evidence, don't you see, is itself a part of the conspiracy. So the pop myth of the KLF can never be blown apart by anything they do, no matter how dumb or embarrassing. The myth will suck it up like a black hole. Also, neither of them ever actually read past the first hundred pages of Illuminatus. It's like 800 pages long. And they tried to later on, they said they weren't really into it. I feel that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so i ended this script by writing like not only this sentence but the following one as well which is in all capital letters with no punctuation and it reads anyway that's what chaos magic looks like in practice fuck yeah let's go boys oh boy okay yeah. well the hierophant order religion yeah group think well also just belief system religion and tradition in general yes all right which can apply to like the music industry the tradition of of musicianship Mm-hmm. The way things are done. Also, it could apply to the underlying genuine philosophy that creeps through a lot of their music and their lyrics. One that's like, you know, Discordian, which is Taoism on acid. Yes. Essentially. It's essentially Taoism on acid. Yeah, but actually that's just what it is. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, it, just like the lyrics like creeping, like, you know, their biggest single, 3 a.m. Eternal, keeps coming back to, you know, everything points to the fact that time is eternal. It's this constant fucking churning engine. And even the idea that there's nothing underpinning the world but chaos still 
assumes an underpinning of things, which is itself a, a type of order. Even if the thing that the engine generates is completely chaotic and completely random, there's still an engine, right? Also, the Hierophant is the trump of Taurus, which money, comfort, and shit. Bill Drummond was a Taurus. Oh, was he? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Um, but like the relationship with money and comfort and shit is also like re- represented in the Hierophant. The Hierophant is both, I mean, in their own way as Discordian priests or whatever the fuck, however you want to say it, as representatives of a specific philosophy, they were both the Hierophant and the Hierophant is also the thing that they were dismantling. Yes. Yeah. Which is the, the sacred cow. Moo moo. I think that's how you pronounce it. The C-H-A-O. The, dis- <laughs> the sacred. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the Hierophant. Basically, I don't know. I love this shit. I I love fucking committing to the bit, and I love fuckers that just make art that is, uh, disarmingly intelligent and strange. Yes, and uh, aggressive in their own way. Aggressive without being violent is is tight as fuck. I don't know, guys. I just I just did what I did do to all my friends, which is make people listen to music that I like. <laughs> That's really why I did this episode. Yeah. Yeah so that's that i think that does her that does her that was a great episode oh thank you yeah that was that was a lot of fun to fucking research and write and listen to yeah hey if you like what we do leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to us uh follow us on social media whatever ones people use these days and uh if you want to support the show if you want to give back get uh access to bonus episodes and to our uh private discord server you can get that at patreon by signing up for our patreon starting at just five dollars a month at patreon.com slash the nonsense bizarre. We don't run any advertisements because like, because fuck that. But like, I don't want to keep saying that because like, I don't know how, you know, never say never, but like, let's say I don't want to. I think that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the nonsense bizarre, get access to bonus content and our discord server for only $5 a month. And it'd be sick if you did. Yeah. All right. Take care, guys. Be well. Take care of yourselves. Hell yeah. Peace out. Peace.